This is the Kingston Morewood College. Beautiful, beautiful building, I'm sure you'll agree. And as we pan back, you'll see how decorative this place really is. Uh, the few rooms I've been in here have all been like this. Totally beautiful. And it's a wonderful setting for the meeting that we're just about to go into now, which is the star of the show, Percy Schmeister. He's on a tour of the UK at the moment. He's been he has literally been to 40 countries in three years talking about GM crops. This is a gentleman that took on Monsanto and won. Some of their crops landed on his land and they tried their bully boy technique on him. It didn't work. And he's in here today to tell us all about it. And also the legal precedent which he um, achieved by the staggering years that he spent fighting them. So let's go and see what Percy has to say. My name is Fanny Charles and I'm the editor of the Blackmore Vale magazine and I was asked to chair this. It came slightly out of the blue actually. Um, I'm very honoured. Um, I'm really sure why, excepting that um, I think Nick Hildyard and um, Jane O'Mara, who has largely coordinated tonight's meeting, um, thought that I would be able to do it in a reasonably neutral way and I hope I can. Um, Blackmore Vale magazine has been covering genetic issues for many years, ever since I had a phone call from Nick Hildyard, who I'm sure many of you will know about. Um, Nick felt five minutes, <laughs> which is to explain to you a little bit about the science of genetic modification, um, a little bit of the importance of the issue of patents, and why tonight's meeting is primarily about intellectual property. And then on my far left is Michael Hart from the Family Farm Association. He's a farmer from Cornwall. The format will be that when I've finished the introductions and given you a few general notes. Well, good evening. Um, I've been given the task to do the scientific uh, introductions, uh, saying five minutes something about what genetic modification is, how it works, how it's done then another five minutes or so on explaining uh, intellectual property rights and patents, and then also looking at uh, something which is called terminator technology, uh, which is a development which is also uh, important in the context of the discussion of intellectual property rights. Just uh, as my, who I am, I am a biologist, I'm a genetic scientist. Uh, presently, I am the co-director of Econexus, which is a public interest research organization based in Oxford. And uh, internationally, I, I work a lot in the, in the South, but also I look, work a lot in international negotiations like the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity and the Biosafety Protocol negotiations where all the different nations come together in order to see how can we do risk assessment, how can we, for example, also look at access and benefit sharing and patents and how do we deal with this. And, and those, I represent the Federation of German Scientists. So that's my accent, but you probably had picked it up already, that is a German accent. Um, uh, okay, what is genetic engineering? I mean, I'm aware, I'm ex trying to explain it in such a way that it helps the discussion of intellectual property rights. So let's just... Um, look at the makeup of, uh, of any organism. So basically in order to, from, from a seed, in order to grow into a big plant or into a tree or for any organism like from an egg cell to grow in, into any animal or into a human, the information of how that can occur needs to be already in that first little cell and it's all basically written down in a genetic code, which is on this long strand of DNA, which every time the cells divide in order for the organism to grow, that whole information gets copied and passed on. So each cell in your body or each cell in a plant will have the same information. The plant cells will have all the same information, a different plant will have different, or humans will have different to that again. But uh, each cell has it. So. Therefore, uh, some organisms, some plants might be very good producers of oilseed, but 
if there is the idea that one wants to be able to grow it um, as a crop that can take wheat killers and also rape, for example, would not have that, that resistance to wheat killers, then I would need to look around, can I bring it in by crossing it with other plants and uh, with other oilseed rape plants or canola, as you call them in Canada. Well, there wouldn't be any around, so then one needs to look around, where else can I find it? And since you, we can't use breeding, there is a new way one can do it, uh, which is not that new any longer. It's been around now for 10, 20 years, the idea. One can basically go to other organisms, completely different organisms. It doesn't need to be a plant. It can be a bacterium. It can be an animal. It can be an insect. Traits can be taken from wherever one wants. So let's say, in this case, for the Aussie drape, I would go and find uh, the genetic information, the trait in a bacteria. So this, I'll find a bacteria that actually um, is not affected if I spray it, let's say, with Roundup, which is a glyphosate, yeah, glyphosate-based herbicide, that's right. So then I take a look at that bacteria and have to try and find the gene which is involved in that. And if I'm lucky, it actually only takes one gene because that is something we should be careful about, that not all traits is just like one information. Quite often it needs a lot of different informations, like when you uh, have a recipe, you need lots of different ingredients in order to, to bake a cake, right? Um, was if for, for some people need more, some you need less information. So then I go and take that gene from that bacteria. Now I need to get it into the plant. For that, I need new methodologies. I can, for example, um, put it on little gold particles or tungsten particles and literally shoot it into plant cells. Or one can use bacteria, which can use it one builds it into a ring and bacteria and uses the bacteria as a shuttle to actually ferry that gene into the organism. Um, we are not able to do that yet with uh, a precision that we would like to be able to, but nevertheless, on all these steps, you can actually have patent rights. Firstly, if you discover the gene, um, it's actually a discovery, but interestingly enough, um, Usually a discovery would not give you a, the right to something, only like if you develop it, if it's an invention. I mean, the question is how can you invent a gene which is already there? How can you invent a trait? But then it is uh, the processes involved in fishing it out and then copying it. There's possibilities to put claims on that, that therefore you end up with being able to claim the right to that gene. And then you have to say, is it the right to, to use it? And in any plant I put it, then I have the ownership of that trait in that plant and therefore of the plant. So you can see there's big questions. Where if, if I have the ownership to a gene, how, how far does the ownership go? And if you look at the international uh, um, different bodies which, or different uh, legal instruments which deal with that, you'll find there is quite a dis discrepancy between different countries. Also, like different organizations want different results. Like scientists, we find often that it hampers our research because if I want to work with something but it's owned by someone else and I need to get access to it, often I need to pay for that, but I will then be allowed to use it, maybe, but only for research, but if there is an application coming out of it that I can't do any longer. You can see it gets all muddled, and quite often we don't get research money any longer if the material we need to use actually is already patented, and therefore there is complications. But then others will have an interest in exactly having lots of patents. So you can see at the negotiations, there'll be farmers on one side, there'll be scientists on another side, there'll be yet uh, different bodies who will all have different opinions. The, the thing is that another part is who, will, who, who is the original owner of it? Is it the plant 
Or is it, for example, in some cases, uh, indigenous people who will have selected plants for generations and generations and generations for their maybe uh, medicinal purposes? Um, they have really looked after that, and they know all about it, and all of a sudden they find that uh, companies have sent prospectors in and have taken the plant, and they take that essence from it back home in the, in the laboratories, and they patent it, and they, they're saying, like, but we were the caretakers. It should be ours. So this is part of the negotiations which we call access and benefit sharing, and we are a bit in a deadlock internationally in that one, especially also since, uh, yeah, who, who, one question we are stuck at is if you have the ownership of something, does that mean you also have the reliability, if something goes wrong with that, that you should actually be responsible and sign responsible? And you can see there is that other element to it then as well. If you claim the responsibility if you claim the, the ownership, do you automatically then have the responsibility to act with it carefully? Or can you just reap the benefits but not have the responsibilities? Big questions. Um, now in terms of, maybe I could get my glass of water. Thank you. Okay. Now... Just briefly, um, in terms of genetic engineering, there's another component which is quite important, which is, as I said earlier, like if this is a gene, yeah, actually it, it is like that, there would be two parts to that. Because there is just the information, yeah, I'm using the author, just the information, which for example would code the information for um, a color or it could be for an enzyme, for a protein. It could be for insulin, which people might be aware of, you know, if you have a, or for blood clotting factor. So if it doesn't work, then there's a problem. So therefore, uh, if you have too much of something, there's also a problem. Therefore, there is a little signal sequence in front, which we call promoter, which will actually tell the body when and where and how much of it should be produced, right? Because we grow hair on our head, right? But otherwise, uh, animals will have it to a much higher extent all over the body. Uh, plants will grow flowers at certain times, at certain parts of the plant. So all that is regulated by this little promoter sequence. According to that, you can again have different applications and you can again have different patterns coming from the same gene, but depending on how you connect it with different uh, promoters or where you put it in, it branches again in different um, applications and intellectual property rights. Now, just briefly uh, looking at the Terminator technology. Now, because there is that problem that it's interesting that we should say it's a problem that plants produce pollen and can outcross because um, it's actually quite vital that they do so. But for intellectual properties, uh, it's a problem um, because what you do, where does it go? Or also in terms of genetic modification, it can be a problem because it can cause um, gene drift, genetic drift or contamination, whatever you call it, and you'll find your genetic modified plant all of a sudden in, in areas you don't want to. So therefore, there is the idea one could actually make a modification that will ensure that plants, when they produce seeds, when the farmer saves the seed, that that seed will not germinate again, right? It's a complicated, it's, it does not exist in reality yet, but the research is to, done to quite an extent. All the patents are there for it already. There is plenty of patents on it. And um, I've done quite a lot of uh, desk research on it. And if you look, the different components are there. The whole thing doesn't work yet. But basically it is, for example, the plant would grow normally, but you have built in quite a lot of different um, new uh, components that, for example, if you then treat the plant with a chemical, you would trigger a switch 
which would then act in the plant and trigger another switch, which would then make the plant produce a toxin uh, in the embryo stage of the seed development, which means it would kill itself. That's why some will call it suicide seeds, right? Or terminator technology. Um, and there's different models you can switch it either on that it produces the toxin or you can by continuous treatment prevent that it's switched on so that those who want to reproduce, I mean multiply the seeds for selling can do so and then there is later no, theoretically no problem about the outcrossing but this is not quite correct because they would still produce pollen, the pollen can still fly and um, outcross and make other plants, uh, neighbor, neighboring fields produce seeds, but those seeds then would not grow any longer. That means, for example, that if a farmer would save, farmers would save seeds and would sow it again, they would have a proportion of their seed not germinating. And also, if one was concerned about genetic contamination, it was also not protect against that. I think that is enough probably in terms of scientific um, rumblings. <laughs> I hope that made it a little clearer, and you see why I wanted a scientist to explain it to you. I'm now going to introduce Percy to you. Percy's from Bruno, Saskatchewan, and he is going to tell you his experience of growing canola, farming for 50 years as an arable farmer in the Great Plains. And his, uh, well, over to Percy. Well, thank you very much. I, I really have to thank everyone involved for bringing me, first of all, to England, then to Wales, and now back to England. Um, <laughs> anyway, I come, as was mentioned, from the heart of the prairies province of Saskatchewan and also the heart of the grain growing area uh, of the prairies. Um, maybe I should give a little background, my wife and myself. Uh, we were known as seed developers and seed savers and rapeseed. If I use the word canola, which we do in Canada, then you'll know I'm talking one and the same, rapeseed or canola. So we were seed developers in rapeseed, and we had done that for over 50 years, where we de were developing new varieties of rapeseed suitable for our climatic and soil conditions, but more important for various diseases we had in rapeseed back on the prairies. I had also been involved in other things. I was also uh, a member of the provincial parliament. I was an MLA. And in my role in government, I had... Uh, been involved primarily in agriculture, representing my province on the provincial level, but also on the federal level in rules, laws, regulations that I thought would always benefit farmers. I was also a member, or also mayor and councillor of my uh, town uh, for uh, over 30 years, again involved in agriculture. So we really ha I really come from an agricultural background. I should say when I said the word, used the word we. I meant also my wife because she had a great role in helping in developing new varieties of seeds and plants. So basically on the prairies, we were known seed developers, seed savers, like hundreds of thousands of farmers who used their seed from year to year and were developing them primarily in rapeseed. We also did work in area of pulse crops, but in peas. So 1996, uh, GMOs were introduced into Canada and United States at the same time. Regulatory approval was given by the Government of Canada, and there were four crops introduced at that time, and that was soya, corn or maize, cotton, and especially by us, rapeseed. So those were the first crops that were introduced. And what I am hearing in many parts of the world, especially Europe, now and in the last six, seven months, were things that we heard in Canada, not only by, from the corporations, but also from the federal government. We would have increased yields. 
uh, we would, it would be more, nutri- more nutritious. But most of all, I think what caught the farmer's ear was less chemical use. And believe me, on the prairies where we're using chemicals by the hundreds of tons each year, which a lot of damage to our environment, but also to human health. I think the whole issue of GMOs can be divided into many, many parts, but I'll try and concentrate on some of them this evening. First of all, you have the food issue. You have the environmental issue. You have the loss of biodiversity. You have the patent laws, intellectual property rights versus farmers' rights. So there's many, many issues that arise when you introduce GMOs. I'll go into immediately what, briefly what has happened to my wife and myself two years after the introduction of GMOs, which I said occurred in 1996. 1998, Monsanto laid what they called a patent infringement lawsuit against my wife and myself. At that point in time, we had never, ever nothing to do with Monsanto. We didn't even know anybody uh, from Monsanto. We had never gone to a meeting or so. So when they laid that patent infringement lawsuit, they said this. We were grown Monsanto's GMO rapeseed without a license from them. And, and as I said, we had never, ever nothing to do with them. And that came as a great shock because we realized as seed developers that possibly the canola that we were developing for 50 years was now contaminated with a GMO which we surely did not want. And we said to Monsanto at the time, if you have contaminated our rapeseed, that we have worked so long for, you should be guilty, there should be liability here, and you should pay for the damages. Now, patent laws in Canada, like many countries of the world, come under federal jurisdiction. So by standing up to Monsanto, it went to Federal Court of Canada with one judge. And how often we wished later on that we could have had a judge and jury with farmers on that knew and understood farming, but that was not to be. So in the two years of pre-trial, before it went to the main trial, Monsanto admitted that we had never, ever used their seed or bought their seed, but they said because they had contaminated us through patent law, they own our seeds and plants. That is the basis it went to federal court. So what the trial judge ruled is what made the case become internationally known overnight all over the world, and it was the first case on patent infringement on a gene or a higher life form. This is what the judge ruled, and I'll just tell you briefly some of it. He ruled, it does not matter how anyone, in my case, a farmer, how you are contaminated. And he went on to say how this could happen. He said, cross-pollination, with pollen flowing in the wind, bees, birds, or whatever, or by direct seed movement, seeds blown in the wind, transportation by farmers, hauling it to the farm, hauling it to the market, and so on. And he said, if that happens, a farmer no longer owns his seeds or plants, and under patent law, they become the ownership, in this case, of Monsanto. You can imagine how we felt when we lost 50 years of research and development overnight to Monsanto. He also ruled we were not allowed to use our our seeds and plants again because of the contamination. Another ruling, it does not matter, he said, the level of contamination. If it's a half percent, if it's one percent or two percent or eight percent, you no longer own your seeds or plants. So that was what the ruling was. And it was unbelievable, and that's what I said, what made the case become known throughout the world how an organic farmer, a conventional farmer, could wake up tomorrow morning, no longer own his seeds or plants if he's contaminated by his neighbor or anybody else. We then decided to fight it, and we then took it or applied to the Federal Court of Appeal. And after a year or two years, we were granted leave for appeal that we could take it to the Federal Court of Appeal. Now we have three judges. But in the Federal Court of Appeal, especially in Canada, you can only discuss points of law or facts of law where the trial judge erred in law. So we could not bring any other items in. And after two years of legal battle, 
the Federal Court of Appeal ruled in favor of the trial judge, although they didn't agree with all of what the trial judge had come down with. And at that point in time, under law, it should have been thrown out because they did not agree all with the trial judges, or, or without the first trial judge. Now, uh, so this is what happened. And as I said, it should have been thrown out at that time. We then lost twice. Four years of legal battle, spent about $300,000, and this, and then we had the one final of avenue or one avenue of appeal left, and that was the Supreme Court of Canada. But our lawyers told us that we have maybe 10 or 11 percent chance that the Supreme Court of Canada would ever hear it because we had lost in the two previous trials. So we made the application anyway, and it was one of the greatest news after five years when the Supreme Court of Canada ruled in our favor that they would hear the case. So now we're in between the Federal Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada agreeing to hear the case. Then Monsanto lays another laws, lawsuit against us for a million dollars where they said they wanted all their legal bills up to that point in time paid for. They wanted license fees. They wanted punitive damage because they said we were stubborn, we were ang or that, and, and, uh, and arrogant, that we wouldn't submit to what Monsanto wanted. So we had another lawsuit. If that was not a ba uh, bad enough, about four months later, they laid another lawsuit where they wanted to seize all our farmland, our house, and all our farm equipment so, that they, so they could stop us from mortgaging our land to fight the legal battle. So we have three lawsuits by the time it went to the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, at the Supreme Court, we had the privilege to bring other items in. And now I will read some of the other items we brought into the Supreme Court of Canada. Number one, can living organisms, seeds, plants, genes, human organs be owned and protected by corporate patents on intellectual property? Number two, can genetic modified traits invade noxious weeds and become noxious weeds that then become resistant to weed killers? We now call them in Canada super weeds and our whole country now is full of it. Number three, can farmers' right to grow conventional or organic crops be protected? Number four, can farmers keep the ancient right to save their own seeds and develop them further if they so wish? But the most important issue to my wife and myself by that time is that who owns life? Has any individual, any corporation the right to put a patent on life and control life. To us, life was sacred, and we said no one should have that right. So those were the issues that were put to the Supreme Court. This is what the Supreme Court ruled. Number one, the court ruled that because we had not benefited, had any benefit by being contaminated, we did not have to pay Monsanto no money. Also the fact that we had never used Monsanto's herbicide roundup on our crop, we did not really use the patent. But what was not fair, the Supreme Court ruled Monsanto has to pay their legal bill, my wife and I have to pay our legal bill. Our legal bill was over $400,000 by then, seven years of our life, and Monsanto's bill was $2 million. And believe me, it's a lot easier for a corporation, a billion dollar corporation plus, to pay $2 million in court fees and legal fees for a test case where they said they wanted to see how far they could exercise patent law over the rights of farmers than for my wife and I to stand up for the rights of farmers and ourselves uh, to pay $400,000. So that was not fair by the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, on the issue of life, what they ruled is still in effect at this moment yet in Canada. Monsa and this is very important, the next sentence I'm going to say. Monsanto's patent on a gene or higher life form is valid. And wherever that gene arrives, by whatever means, in any higher life form, they own and control that higher life form. Now think of the implications of that. How far can you go with the patents on life? Can you go all the way 
to, uh, as far as a human being. The Supreme Court then went on and said it has to go back to the Parliament of Canada to bring in new laws, new regulations to, on, on the regards to the patents on life and the sacredness of life. Also, they said laws have to be brought in to protect the rights of farmers. So that is what it, where it stands now in Canada. Now, we believe that Monsanto at that time thought they had a major victory when the Supreme Court ruled they own and control a higher life form. But as was mentioned before, if you own and control a higher life form and you put it in the environment like a seed or a plant where you cannot control it, then you should be liable for the damages. And now we've entered a new era of liability. So we were watching our fields very closely after the decision from the Supreme Court. And sure enough, in the year 2005, we noticed that one of our fields, which was a very small field of 50 acres, which we were using for, for mustard research, there were canola plants growing on that field in the fall of 2005. We did some testing, and we, through testing, we realized that it was a strong possibility. It was Monsanto's GMOs again, rapeseed on our, in our field. So we notified Monsanto and said, we think that we have been contaminated by you again in one of our fields that we're going to be using for must research. And in all the trials they said that if a farmer feels he is contaminated, with Monsanto's GMO genes, all he has to do is notify Monsanto and they would come out and remove the offending plants or the seeds or plants. So we notified Monsanto and indeed two days later they did come out. We had staked out 10 or 12 plants where we had sprayed Roundup on. They took samples from those plants, they took samples from other plants in this 50 acres and we also got copies of everything that they took. Two days later, they notified us and said, yes, indeed, it's their GMO rapeseed again on our field. And they asked us what we wanted to have done with the contamination. And we, told, we had told Monsanto what we had planned to use that field for the following year. And we said to Monsanto, we want every plant, every rapeseed plant on this 50 acres removed by hand. And they agreed to do that. And two days later, my wife gets a fax from Monsanto. I was not home. And in that fax was called a release form. But there was a whole paragraph in that release form blocked out. My wife contact, uh, contacted Monsanto and said, there is no way we're going to sign a release form unless we can read the whole document. They then sent the complete document without the paragraph being blocked out. This is what it said in that blocked out paragraph. My wife, myself, or any member of our family could never ever take Monsanto to court again for the rest of our lives, no matter how much they contaminated us in the future on that field. And we said, no way. But the most important thing was they had also a gag order. We, my wife, myself, or any member of our family could never ever talk to the press or anyone what the terms of settlement were. And we said to Monsanto, there is no way we're ever going to give up our freedom of speech and we refuse to sign it. <laughs> Monsanto said then, we will not remove the plants. The battle was on. And um, so we said to Monsanto, we are going to remove the plants ourselves before the, the pods ripen and the seeds get into our soil. And they sent us a fax back and said, we wish to remind you that those plants on your field are our property and you're not allowed to do with those plants what you want. So we notified Monsanto and said, get your property off of our property, you're trespassing. <laughs> so it went back and forth and finally, before the seeds, uh, before the pods went into seed, we, uh, with the help of two neighbors, we physically removed all the canola plants from 50 acres and we notified Monsanto when we were doing this. I paid my neighbor $640 to help and then we sent Monsanto the bill. And 
Monsanto refused to pay it unless we signed the release form. So it went on back and forth for about a year. Oh, in the meantime, they also sent us a fax and said, we wish to remind you that it would be in your best interest not to see mustard in that field the following year because of the contamination. You can really not sort out canola or rapeseed from mustard seed. So then we said to Monsanto, now you are telling us what we can do or not do with our land. I said, we own the land, we pay the taxes on the land, we're going to do what we want with our own land. So anyway, sent them the bill, they wouldn't pay it, so went to a judge, and then we thought, what way can we do bring them to court? We had enough of seven years of legal battle, and we, my wife and I talked it over seriously, and we then were prepared to go back to court if it had to be for another seven years of living hell. We made that decision, and then we decided what court would we take Monsanto to, and we decided on small claims court. And in small claims court, if a judge issues a summons, we have Monsanto in court immediately. We don't have to have any pretrial. We did that. The judge agreed with us signed a summons against Monsanto, and we had a billion-dollar corporation in court on a $640 bill. <laughs> so in, in March of this year, uh, Monsanto, we, the judge had set a date. We went into court. When the, when the judge came in, Monsanto's lawyer and Monsanto got up and said, we will settle out of court. They had a check in hand for the $640 plus $20 cost, and we, it was the greatest victory for us after 10 years now of legal battle, where now we have a precedent set where a corporation now has accepted liability and now opens a door for farmers all over the world, whether it's buyers and gent or whatever, that you have some legal avenue to take a corporation to court if you are contaminated. So that's, like I said, after 10 years of legal battle, it was a great victory, not only for ourselves, but for farmers all over the world. So that's the issue of what we went through and our lawsuits with Monsanto. Now let's go back to GMOs. 1996 introduced, and 1998, the lawsuit. I will say to you this evening some things that will really surprise you. First of all, there is absolutely no coexistence if you ever introduce GMOs in whatever crop it's introduced. There is no such thing as containment. You cannot contain pollen flow, seeds blown into wind, transportation, or so. Whether the contamination is by pollen flow with bees or with wind or whatever, or seeds blown hundreds of miles. There is no such thing as coexistence. There is no longer a choice. You no longer have a choice. It all becomes GMOs in a matter of a few years. Um, to give you how bad it is now in Canada with GMOs, in those four crops, but primarily on rapeseed and soya, we no longer have any pure rapeseed left in Canada. Our total seed stock now is all GMO. You cannot raise a GMO-free canola crop in Canada, nor can you raise a soya-free conventional crop anymore organically. So it all now is GMO in Canada, soya and rapeseed. So you, an organic farmer, a conventional farmer, no longer has a choice. If you want to seed rapeseed in Canada, all the seed stocks are now contaminated with GMOs. Now, the other important issue that has come out, and that has been out now already at least four years, rapeseed comes from the brassica family. We ha it has very close cousins as well as distant cousins. Close cousins, radishes, turnips, cauliflower, and, and other plants. Distant cousins, mustard, well mustard. Through cross-pollination, the GMO gene from rapeseed is now into those market garden crops, making more crops organic farmers no longer can raise in Canada. So, as I said, 
if you introduce GMOs, you will totally eventually destroy the organic farmers. You might as well tell the organic farmers it's over if you ever introduce GMOs. So now, so those are the crops that are totally contaminated in North America. The bright side of the, on the other side of the coin is this. Because we realize the dangers of introducing the, those first four crops, no new crops in Canada have been introduced since 1996. We've had 13 years of crops now of GMOs in those first four crops that I mentioned. They wanted to bring in GMO wheat, GMO flax, GMO rice, GMO alfalfa, and it was not allowed in Canada because we've seen the damage what the first four crops have done. Believe me, if GMO wheat would ever, ever be introduced into North America or in any part of the world, you would totally destroy the organic farmer because wheat comes from the grass family. It's bad enough with rapeseed, but let alone wheat. And so it was not allowed in Canada. Now, there's many other issues. The Terminator was mentioned. Uh, what it has really meant is to get total control over the seed supply and then the food supply. Monsanto now is the largest seed company in the world. They have went from a chemical company to a seed company. And what the danger of that is that they've been buying up many organic seed companies in the world, especially in North America, out in British Columbia, state of California. Now it's becoming very difficult for organic farmers on the West Coast to get organic seeds because of the ownership of Monsanto, which now will not sell a lot of the organic seed from those companies they bought. They bought, not long ago, a company in California that had 2,500 varieties of organic seeds. So if they cannot control it through patent law, the seed supply, they're going to try and control it through the control or ownership of seed companies. So those are some of the issues that arise. Remember again, you no longer have a choice, no coexistence, and no containment. So that is what happens with the introduction of GMOs. Now, I will guarantee you that if you introduce GMOs, you will use from three to five times more chemicals than before. Your yields will go down. 15% at least by the Department of Agriculture on soya, 8 to 10% on rapeseed, your yields will go down. But the, the biggest problem and concern we have is the massive increased use of chemicals. I should also say the nutritional value of many of the GMO foods now are only 50% of what it was before. And I won't go into the reason why that has happened. So you have less yields, more chemical use, and less nutritious. That is what the results have been with the introduction of GMOs. We have seen absolutely no benefit, but everything has been a negative. And also, I should say, in 1996, there were buzzwords that I hear now in Europe that was used in Canada and the United States. We'd always have sustainable agriculture. Now we would be able to feed a hungry world. Believe me, if anything is going to lead to more hunger in the world, as we've seen it in North America, it's going to be the introduction of GMOs. So those are some of the issues that have arisen. Now, there is a whole other side to the introduction of GMOs that you never, ever hear about, and it's the social impact it's had on our rural communities. We call it the culture of fear, the breakdown of our world social fabric. And I think I will take the time just to show you some of the things that also happen. I have a contract here from Monsanto. And in that contract, to me, it's one of the vicious, most vicious contracts on the face of the earth. Farmer can never use his own seed. He must buy always the seeds from Monsanto. Uh, he must only use Monsanto's chemicals. He must pay Monsanto $15 a hectare license fee on each oak each acre he owns each year. He must permit Monsanto's police force to come on his land for three years after he signs his contract, and then Monsanto's police can go into a farmer's granaries, into his fields, 
get his tax records, his farming records, with or without the farmer's permission. Another clause in here, you're not, if something happens to your seed, or, or, or the seed was not good, or didn't pr uh, germinate good, you can never take Monsanto to court for any damages. Mm -hmm. Another clause here, if something, if a farmer happens to commit some violation of this contract, and Monsanto makes him, the farmer, destroy his crop, or takes all the profit from his crop, um, the farmer cannot talk about it. A non, or a gag order, a non-disclosure statement, the same thing that they wanted to get my wife and myself to sign. So why, you may ask, why would a farmer ever sign a contract like that to give up his rights? A lot of times the order form was on one side, the contract was on the back side, and believe me, it was in such small print you needed a magnifying glass to read it. But it doesn't matter now whether you sign that contract or not. Under patent law, as was stated, if you are contaminated against your wishes, whether you're an organic farmer or conventional farmer, you fall under the same conditions as if you signed the contract, if you are contaminated. The other issue is that if you now open up a bag of seed, on the bag of seed is this notice. It's in smaller, uh, smaller size. And in it, it states, by opening up this bag of seed, you agree to all of the terms and conditions of Monsanto's patent number, so and so. So you don't, if you are contaminated, if you open a bag of seed, you fall under the same conditions if you sign that contract initially. One other point I'm going to bring up, and I think this is the worst thing that could have happened to our farmers. And as a former politician, I think I have never seen something so more, so more vicious than this. Here is a brochure from Monsanto. It's in our farm newspapers, in our Western Canadian farm newspapers. In the United States, they even advertise this on the radio. It states here, if you think your neighbor is growing Monsanto's GMOs without a license, inform on your neighbor to us and we will give you a free gift. And normally in Western Canada, a farmer will get a free leather jacket from Monsanto if he happens to do that for whatever reason to his neighbor. But what happens is not nice. Even immediately, Monsanto will send out two of their police, we call them gene police on the prairies, to a farmer's home. And they'll say to a farmer, we have this tipper rumor, you might be grown GMO, rapeseed, or soya, whatever. And a farmer will say, I'm an organic farmer. I'm a conventional farmer. I don't want to grow GMOs. I'll have nothing to do with it. And they'll say to a farmer and his wife, you're lying. If you don't confess, we'll take you to court. And the time we're through with you, you won't have a farm left. So what do you think goes through a farmer's mind when these gene police leave or Monsanto's investigators leave a farmer's home? A farmer will think, was it this neighbor or a neighbor here or a neighbor over here that has caused me this trouble? Now you have a suspicion amongst farmers. Farmers scared to talk to one another on coffee row. Farmers scared to talk what they're seeding them back and forth. So you have that whole new suspicion of fear or a culture of fear, the breakdown of our real social fabric by Monsanto's policies. And I often think back in my own family. My grandparents came to Canada about the 1890s. And my grandparents and my parents had to work together with our neighbors to build our country, schools, hospitals, churches, and so on. Now we have that breakdown of our real social fabric. And believe me, I think that social issue is one of the worst things that could have happened with the introduction of GMOs. There are other things they do, and I think I have a few minutes time. If Monsanto cannot find a farmer at home, They'll get his mailing address through the municipality or county, and they'll mail a farmer this letter. Farmers call these extortion letters. We don't know how many thousands of these have been sent out in North America. But believe me, if anybody has said something negative about Monsanto, you will get a letter from them. Here it states, we have reason to believe that you might be growing Monsanto's GMO without a license. We estimate you have 200 acres, 500 acres. In lieu of us not taking you to court, 
because we think you might be growing GMOs, send us $200,000, $100,000 in two weeks' time, and we may or may not take you to court. Can you imagine the fear in a farm family when they get a letter from a billion-dollar corporation, send us $100,000 in two weeks' time? Another clause, you're not allowed to show this letter to anyone or we will fine you. So that is what's going on. We never thought this could happen to us in Canada. We're a first world country. But believe me, it is happening not only in our country, but also in the United States. And I think it's important. There's a lot more issues than just patent laws or GMO seeds or plants, but the whole issue of control of people and fear in, in, in people by a corporation. What better way than to control people than by fear? It has not been easy for my wife and I to stand up to Monsanto for 10 years. And if it wouldn't have been for my wife, I don't think I could have never done it myself without my family, my neighbors, and so on. And many times I felt like giving up and I'd come home from traveling around the world and I was realizing, what have, am I doing to my wife, my friends, and so on by standing up for Monsanto? My friends were scared to talk to me. Every time they talked to me, they would look to say, maybe somebody from Monsanto is watching. So it was a living hell, as I said, for seven years. What else did they do to us? I said before, they tried to seize our land, our house, our machinery, and so on. They would watch us all day long, many times when we worked in our fields. They would sit in their vehicles along the road. They would come into our driveway and watch what my wife was doing all day long. She would get phone calls, you better watch it, they're going to get you. Many other forms. They would go to our neighbors and say, if you support Percy and Louise Schmeiser, we're going to come after you, and by the time we're through with you, you won't have a farm left. So you can imagine the fear that we went through. We were scared they were going to torch us house. They were going to break my legs from the threats that we were receiving. Worst of all, my wife and I were speaking at Parliament in Cape Town in South Africa. And coming out of the assembly, we ran face to face with one of Monsanto's representatives from Johannesburg. And he was really, we say, he lost his cool. And he came down to us and, to, my, and to, uh, to me and my wife, shook his fist in my wife's face, my face, and said, nobody stands up to Monsanto. We're going to, we're going to get you, and we're going to destroy both of you somehow, someday. So you can imagine how we felt. So those are some of the issues. There's many other issues that arise when you introduce GMOs. I haven't come here this evening from Canada to tell you what to do. I'm here to tell you what has happened to us as Canadian farmers in 1996. We didn't have anybody to come and tell us what would happen, but you have that benefit. And the choice you make now will be your choice. But also, we are at a, in a, a fork in the road. The choice you make today will affect generations and generations to come. Because talking to many scientists around the world, we don't know yet if it ever can be recalled. You cannot say, well, we'll try it for two years. If we don't like it, we'll stop. It doesn't work that way. You introduce it, it's over, and it's over, and you no longer, I guarantee you, will have any organic farmers. So it's an important choice that you have to make now here in England. My wife and I have 15 children. I'm sorry, five children, 15 <laughs> grandchildren. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the, the land might be fertile in Canada, but it's not that fertile. But it's not that fertile. <laughs> anyway, we have five children and we have 15 grandchildren. One great grandchild and one on the way. And uh, we often looked at this in the last 10 years, what, what kind of a legacy do we really want to the future generations? Do we want uh, our future generations, our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, to have air and water, soil, and so on, food with poisons? I don't think any of us here tonight want to ha leave that kind of a legacy, and neither do we are. Do we? And that's why we've given 
all that we have the rest of our lives to fight for the rights of people to always have good food, safe food, and so on. And so that we can leave that legacy, as I said. So, but you have to do something now. Tomorrow, it will be too late. Mm -hmm. So with that, again, as long as my wife and I, my wife is 76, she'll be 77 in a short time, so we'll all be 78. And we gave a commitment back in 1998 when we stood up to Monsanto that as long as we have life in us, we're going to go down fighting for the rights of people and farmers all over the world in regards that they always have safe food and be able to use their seed from year to year. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I don't know quite how to follow that. Um, other than to say as a Cornish farmer that the idea that a small field is 50 acres <laughs> is a, <laughs> somewhat of a surprise. That's a, that's a third of my farm. Um, as I've just said, I'm a Cornish farmer. I um, have also been involved for quite a long time on the issues surrounding GM. And one of the things that I've been able to do is to travel quite a bit um, and meet farmers from around the world. So I've met farmers from the US, I've met farmers from uh, India on their farms um, and, and spoken to them about GM. And what, I, what Percy didn't say is that his story is repeated many, many times, except that those farmers didn't do what he's done and to take on Monsanto. I met farmers that, that, as Percy was talking about uh, a few minutes ago, who wouldn't talk to me, even though I was an English farmer and had come you know, over to visit them on their farms about GM and about the fact that Monsanto um, and other companies had done what he was referring to in the letters, taken them or threatened to take them to court. Um, they showed me all the letters. Again, they're not supposed to. I, at one point, I hoped that maybe I could get some copies of these letters. But Monsanto are quite clever, and, and the other companies, that each letter is individually written. So if you took them and tried to reproduce them, they would probably be able to trace back where they came from. And all of them have a, a gagging order on them. And I met many, many farmers right across seven or eight states in the US who had signed these and were, the other key thing that they do is to insist that you then grow GMOs, um, which is why they can then claim, of course, that you know, 10 million farmers or whatever it is they claim around the world grow GM. Well, of course they do. If you've got your arm up your back, you're going to grow them. Um, what about the situation facing UK farmers? I think there's not a lot of difference between what Percy's experience, the experience I saw of other farmers in the US and us. The law, a lot of the laws of the US and of, of Canada in particular are similar to our legal system. Um, and those patents will apply here. Um, those technological agreements will apply here. They'll have to, otherwise there's not much point in them introducing GMO crops to Europe because it's not just, of course, the UK, it's also a Europe-wide thing. Um, so for me as a farmer and a UK farmer, what really frightens me is that, that I will lose the choice, my right as a farmer, to grow what I want to grow and to produce what consumers tell me that they want. Um, and. I don't see how, if we introduced GM crops to the UK, that we're going to be able to not, to, we're going to be able to grow non-GM crops. Because as Percy said, it took very few years to get the whole of Canada GM only. Um, we're tiny compared with the size of Canada. It wouldn't take very long at all for the spread across the UK. Probably surprising to you, I would also say that the farmers that want to grow GM probably should have the right to grow GM if they want to do that. You can't have the right one way and not the other. 
But at the same time, those farmers that wish to grow it have got to take responsibility for it if it affects the farmers that don't want to grow it. Um, and that, um, most farmers that I've spoken to that are pro-GM, shall we say, when I say, okay, fine, if you want to grow it, as long as when I get it onto my fields or the organic farmer gets it, um, he has some right to come back to you and say, excuse me, you've just ruined my business because I can't sell what I've grown. And the immediate answer is, well, I can't be responsible for what the wind does. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to be because, you know, otherwise farmers like myself that don't want to grow it or organic farmers that don't want to grow it are not going to have their rights. Um, there was two things I wanted to mention further, I think, because I'm sure you've all got lots of questions to ask Percy. One was, um, I'm pretty sure that the technological agreement that Percy had just now also states that Monsanto is not responsible beyond the germination of the seed. So going back to what was said right at the start, where does it end? As far as I'm aware on that agreement, and the same in the US, basically, like a normal seed supplier, if it germinates, okay, it's yours. If it doesn't germinate, you can go back to them and say, this seed you've provided me with doesn't work. But I think that, again, brings up the question, where does their responsibility end and start? And we need to define that. And I think there is a great deal to be done on the laws regarding patents and this, which is possibly even more important than whether GMOs are safe to eat or use or whatever, because it, it's not just about uh, crops. It's also about genes that they've taken patents out on, on human beings. When I was in India, there was Indian farmers who had... I mean, if you can imagine people who are very poorly educated, they have the concept of somebody owning a gene inside something, if they even understand what the gene part is, is uncomprehensible. And they often said to me that this plant here is a medicinal plant. We use it for headaches or whatever it was that they used that plant for. But we know, we've been told we can't use it now because Monsanto or Sagenta or whoever it is has patented the genes of that plant and we're not allowed to use it. So it, there are issues um, surrounding things. And I often, when people say, well, what do you mean? If you look at it like this microphone, somebody has designed this, taken out a patent on it, and you can't produce a microphone that looks like that because you'll infringe their patent. That's fine. I can understand that. But when it becomes uh, nature and it's transferable and you have no control over it, then I do not see that the current patent laws can apply to that. And I think we need to change it. The other thing from a British farmer's point of view, um, knowing that I was coming here today to um, speak very briefly on this, I rang around a number of insurance companies and asked them what their position was on liability. And basically, they were not willing to discuss it, is probably the best way to put it. Um, they, their excuse, their get-out clause was, well, we don't have any GMO crops in the UK, therefore it's not an issue at the moment. Only one company, when I pushed them, said that they probably would not insure anybody for any liability. So for any farmers that, that unless that changes, unless... For any farmers that, if we adopt it and grow it, any farmers that grow it will, could more than likely find themselves out on their own. Um, and that has happened in Spain. There are a number of organic farmers that had um, GM maize, which is grown in Spain, grown alongside them, and they got um, the GM trait into their organic, lost their organic status, and have had no way of coming back because they're their neighbours, all they'll do is put them out of business if they sue them. They've not got enough money to sue Monsanto or Sagenta or whoever the supplier of the, the maize was. Um, they have nothing except that they have lost their status as organic farmers. 
So I think we need to, to question seriously, not just on whether it's safe to use, safe to think, or whether it works for farmers in terms of more or less pesticides or whatever, but, but on the question of this patents and the rights surrounding that, and not just about the other issues. Thank you.
Gentlemen. Uh, Chris Lenz. Um, my interest here is, is as a beekeeper, so um, I, I may actually become responsible for genetic drift. And of course, I'd like to know um, what um, I'm going to be um, feeding myself and my customers. Uh, um, but really, my question to Percy is, have you thought of buying a share in Monsanto so you could go along the shareholders' meetings and uh, uh, speak? <laughs> well, I often thought that I should buy a couple of shares in Monsanto, go to Monsanto meetings, but there was, I had one objection to it, and that was from my wife. She said, if you ever buy any shares in Monsanto, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Principle, I bought one share in Tesco. Um, and the problem is, yes, you can go to the annual general meeting, but it doesn't necessarily mean once they recognize you, and I'm sure Percy could recognize you, not if you ask any question. Um, BC Anthony from Wessex Organic. Um, it's interesting this question about rights and responsibility and how, where the sort of rights and responsibilities start and end. Um, for me, it, 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 it's an interesting um, aspect on a much wider argument, really, about how we use resources and who's responsible for the damage that's caused. I, mean, I, I think I'm a beekeeper as well. <laughs> um, and I, I think in the last 20 years or so, we've, we've seen problems with conventional farming in the way that we do lots of things, for example, pesticides and the run off into water courses and that those sorts of issues. I think this is just a, a sort of continuation of, of those those types of issues, I suppose. And because it's such a new technology, I think it's it's an agreement, a, a contract that um, all producers and consumers are going to have to renegotiate at some point. So. Uh. I think there's a really another issue that we're uh, or item that we're missing. We're talking about loss of income to farmers, organic farmers, and so on. What about the loss of biodiversity? If you get down to one variety of seeds or plants, and that's a concern my wife and I have a lot of seed developers, and you have some disease, some blight, or something happens, you've got nothing to fall back, and that's a big, big concern to us. Yeah, I mean, it just in a similar direction to this, Percy just was saying, um, that, y yes, you are right. I mean, whenever something new is uh, introduced in our society, I mean, it, it, it can be plants, it, it can be medicines, it can be other technologies, it does not matter. Um, it, it needs a renegotiation, which also means everybody needs to be involved and one needs to look at facts and see what it means. And also it would mean that uh, it's, when one looks at the different facts from the different backgrounds, it could be the science, it could be like legal aspects, it, it, it could be ethical. The decision then, again, whom is it taken by? That is a big question in that. Because what we have at present is that it's fine to listen to everything, but at the end it usually says um, it's based on sound science. Right? So the science, if the science gives the green light, then it's fine. If the science doesn't, you'll find still a few scientists who will do that, and then it still moves through because there is a, a, an enormous pressure on in terms of interests behind it, which push it faster than any of us can actually anticipate, leave alone, um, investigate, and properly check the problems that can occur. That means that's also partly why we have the biosafety protocol. That's why we have uh, risk assessment procedures, which we, for example, uh, know there is the whole issue about genetically modified trees. Right? And we know trees produce a lot of pollen. They are wind pollinators. Now, they are already being produced. Now we are starting in the international community to look at what kind of risk assessment can we use in order to understand what the risks are? But, but we are already... Just, you, see, you see, like it's like putting the cart in front of the horse, or whatever it's called. <laughs> Something like that. Um, basically, if we are serious and we feel like a, a, a technology 
could benefit, then take the time and do it in, in awareness of what risk might be, investigate them, see how one can modify, sort of, and negotiate, renegotiate. But uh, it, it is a problem when something is just placed in the middle and say, well, okay, now we all have to somehow readjust to that. And uh, because we will not be able from science to actually say what the outcome is, we all can say about the risks. But we don't really want to do all the, the research, if even the research means we introduce more risks by that. So then we have also to be careful with our research. Oliver. Um, Oliver Dowding, uh, farmer. Um, I'd just like to take you back. I mean, there's a lot of farmers in this country who think they're big businessmen and they've got a certain degree of impunity and they can actually stand up to Monsanto, work with them or, and other com chemical companies as well and all will be fine. We'll take on this technology, it'll be great. But mention was made earlier of the Indian farmers and the problems they've got. And I understand that entirely. Cast your mind back, because most of the people in this room will be able to remember Bhopal. <coughs> now, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was Dow who were involved there. And I don't think they've settled up the legal bills even now. So you think they're going to settle up the legal claims that you've got in, in if there's going to be a problem with GM? No chance. And I don't know whether the person has the same view, but I have got no faith at all that they will respond next year to a problem. He's taken 10 years and only just now got some degree of satisfaction, uh, you know, a lot of his life's gone chasing a, a company in a court. That is not the way we want to carry on with farmers. All right, Union Carbide, beg your pardon. Initially, and then Bill Woodpark. I understand, and so I'm right, that the EU are allowed under tremendous pressure from every quarter to allow genetically engineered maize, I think the North American call it corn, uh, in for animal feed. Now, don't our distinguished panel see that as a danger or the thin end of the witch? Because I also understand that they're raising acceptable tolerance of contamination as well. Your comments are much appreciated. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure here because as far as I'm sort of the focus of the debate or what we're talking about is about patents, um, is about ownership. But at the same time, there is a problem in that, which is who is like if, if a farmer, for example, does not want to have GM feed in it, and, and the corn device is contaminated. Quite often we have the problem, it, it will be by varieties which might not even be legal, right, then, uh, which we, by that I mean which haven't been approved, then there's the zero tolerance, but you need to be able to, to show that because, again, in order to test for that, you need to know what might be in there. In order for that, you need to have the gene, you need to know the gene and how you can um, sort of pin it down, basically, how to identify it in there, but for that, you will not get it because there's a patent on it, right? So, therefore, we strongly rely on companies to give us the methodology, or like sometimes we even insist that they will be doing the tests um, in order to know what is in there. And uh, so, we, we have problems. I, I wouldn't see sort of like where the thin end of, of the wedges you're talking about there, but uh, the, the problem definitely is that. Uh, it's getting harder and harder for farmers to have GM free animal feed if they so want, because the contamination is very wide. And I think this is also like, in recognition of that, the threshold was much higher than a lot of farmers would like or consumers would like, um, which is allowed in there. And in, in a why, yes, but that could be seen as a thin end of the regions because if, if more and more would be allowed. But it's because reliability and redress is insulted. We don't know how to handle it, except then like make the allowances bigger, if you know what I mean, like the, the thresholds. And so basically what is required is really to say, clear labeling is, I know in Germany that it requires now, or in you, um, it requires the labeling of whether animals have been fed GM 
or non-GM. And that helps to actually sort the, um, the what's it called, this, the, the, state, the, 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 the chain, the um, supply chain, right, to, to, to sort that one out. So, in, in a way, if, if we think something has a problem, then we should say, right, we want it sorted, and not let it allow it to move on its own. I should maybe add a little bit. In North America, both our countries, U.S. and Canada, we do not have labeling. So we do not know what's in our food. So you can imagine that we didn't consider it. we have about that. If we would, what we are saying, if we would have labeling, then we could, uh, the doctors and medical professionals could build up a data about the foods that you're eating, and if the food you're eating were primarily GMOs or so, you could build up that health database, and that's why one of the reasons they won't give us, the corporations won't give us the labeling, and we've been de demanding it from our government, I think eventually uh, we will get it. But what makes it more important now, it has come out, now we know about this for about a year, we have six major drugs now being produced by plants, <coughs> being done in the open and in the wild, as we call it. So it's bad enough to eat a food with GMOs in we can now be eating foods for the prescription drugs and six major drugs. Industrial enzyme, contraceptives, growth hormones, uh, blood thinners, blood clockers, and stuff. I was in a meeting in California this year, and there was a doctor there from Oregon, and he gave a lot of different cases. One of the two of the cases he gave out of many, he said if a woman is pregnant, and then she now eats food in North America with a contraceptive drug, yet, what will the results be? A person has had surgery, come home from a hospital, and then eat a food with a blood thinner. Mm -hmm. These are the things that we're, we're being faced in North America. In that terminator gene, where it's a termination of life, basically, we say it's absolutely criminal that it was ever, ever allowed or even to be produced in North America. These companies call themselves life science. You come out with a gene that terminates life, the future of life. It's the greatest assault on life we've ever seen on this planet. So those are the issues. There's many issues we be, we are being faced in North America. And as I said before, we have more problems than we have answers for now with the introduction of genomes. Yes. Um, I'm John Burbage. Uh, I'm a small farmer and also a farm worker from Yetminster. And it strikes me very clearly that there's a contradiction between paint law and basic human rights. And really there's only a political solution to this. It's not a legal solution because the law isn't up with the technological developments. And the political solution is clearly needed. I was privileged to see a film on Monsanto made by a French journalist. And it was really disturbing because the original George Bush, um, how much he released the kind of controls over companies like Monsanto to allow them to do what they've done. That was a political decision. And it was, he was primed before he came to power for this, and when he came to power it happened. So there is only a really a political solution to the situ situation rather than a legal one, in my opinion. <coughs> First of all, thank you to the three inspiring, incredible speakers. Um, I've really got curly hair, so I can't curly anymore. Of course, we'll see the point, interlinked points. Is there potential for the technology to do good? Um, so, is it the technology that we're scared of, or the views of the power? that seems to be emanating from it, which is just yeah, terrifying, scaring your words. Is a no pollen producing plant possible? So if you've got a good technology, choose a plant that you, is a good plant and doesn't produce pollen to contaminate anything out, at that, outside that. Could that be a framework that get built in the political any political view to make. And finally, more on a personal level, do Mon Monsanto have any subsidiaries in the UK that supply farm seed? 
But I hope you'll see they're all linked, those three quite first they're all linked. Okay, um, that's the easiest one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Monsanto has, uh, in about 80 countries of the world, have a head office. There are worldwide head, head offices in St. Louis, Missouri, in the U.S. So that's the world head office. I would say that in any country of the world that where they have an office or a head office, they have the facilities to supply any type of seed uh, that you want. So but what I, the point I made is that do they have any subsidiaries who are currently supplying UK farmers with seed and therefore farmers could unwittingly be signing these contracts? That I can't answer. I, I, I don't know. But so this is what I've been doing. I've been getting out of the contract. But I, I would answer that a little bit this way too. If you have any test plots of GMO seeds or plants, that had to come from somewhere. Yeah. I, I think the answer in regards to that, as far as I'm aware, at the moment, can we keep up? there isn't a risk of a, of a UK farmer signing that agreement because that's specific to GMAT. So when you're just buying what is conventional seed, and, and unless there's royalty um, on that seed, then there's nothing really to, to worry about from that point of view. As to whether Monsanto has a subsidiary I, or a, a owns any companies, I am not entirely sure because they are very, very clever at um, hiding what they do own. And, uh, I've got a, a friend in Canada, a Canadian and a few, who did quite a lot of work trying to trace you know, who was owned by what and why and how. And all he discovered was lots of joint ventures and jointly owned companies and partnerships and, and in the end, kind of gave up, you know, when he got to the sheet of paper that was that wide and that high that, that he looked like a, a sort of family tree on, um, he gave up because he just... I do know in India they're quite clever at buying up companies to supply seed, and, and, but the Monsanto name doesn't appear. So, you know, people believe they're buying it from their local seed company as they've always done, but who has been bought out by Monsanto. So there was a question from the gentleman over there about human rights. There are many issues that arise in regards to human rights. In Canada and mostly all the land grant colleges in the United States, a lot of the research funding now comes from the private purse, which is the corporations, and very little from the public purse. And that's a drastic violation of human rights of our academic community. When they have to do research which is funded now by the corporations, they're not free to release the information to the public as a true science it should. So it's a drastic violation of human rights in regards to our scientific community. And I'm very concerned about that. My wife and I have six grandchildren in the university right now. What kind of a future will they have? if they are controlled by corporations in their research and what they are allowed to release to the public. And that's what a true science, scientist's uh, job really is, to release that information. Uh, my wife and I took this human rights issue as far as we could go. We took it to the United Nations Human Rights Commission in Geneva, where Canada is charged for drastic violations of human rights in regards to the whole company on seeds and plants and our life, we said, first of all, it's a drastic violation that people in Canada don't know what's in their food, that the academic uh, community is limited into what they can express, and there are other issues, and the rights of farmers to use their seed and develop them. So those are charges now laid against the Canadian government by my wife and myself. It was not easy to take our own government to Geneva on violations of human rights, but we felt so strongly about it. In Canada, they have not replied to these charges as yet. I was going to answer the scientific questions, but I, could, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, it's possible to uh, produce plants that uh, don't produce pollen, because we have that in nature already, you know, sort of, oh, sorry, yeah. um, we have that in nature already, but uh, 
for, for example, hazel will, you know, sort of like have female plants, have male plants, you know, sort of, and different plants will do that. And that doesn't prevent uh, them from reproducing, right? Because then the, the plant which will just have, uh, the, which will not produce pollen, but still has, you know, the, the egg cells, will, will just be fertilized, you know, and then set seeds and then in the case of the hazel, the, the squirrels come and move them around, or people will, or otherwise, but nature has in, in mind of how to spread it. So that is not a solution. Um, there was another question whether I uh, can see genetic engineering or genetic modification as uh, producing something potentially positive. Not non producing plant. That's what, yeah, I, I just answered that. There was another yeah. question. Is the, uh, is the technology we're afraid of or the abuse of power? That's the first question. Is, is, there, is there potentially a positive use? So long as we can contain the gene pool. Yeah. See, and I come from a background also I've worked for many years uh, in the field of human gene therapy. Um, I remember us in the late 80s, uh, the early 90s, still saying like, oh, at maximum 10 years, like it was in the field of uh, hemophilia I was working, blood clotting disease. Um, 10 years maximum, and we have it in place, right? That it will help people who have sort of a problem with, with the, the blood will not clot during injury, that we will be able to, to do something. We still haven't, right? Why am I saying that here? I'm saying we can always come up in our minds, it, everything, with positive ideas, with something we can do with it. Whether it's feasible or not, whether it's doable or not, we will only learn through the course. And what side effects are, we will also only learn through the course. For example, my organization has put a lot of effort into looking at just what the, the technology itself, genetic modification does. Yeah? Um, um, so we are not even looking necessarily at the traits or the genes we put in, but just the technology, and that, that in itself can already scramble the genome and therefore affect the plant or whatever it is in a way that is not predictable. So what, do we, what are we looking for then? Because it's not just the effect of the trait, right? So therefore, in order to answer that question, I can say, yes, we can all dream up things, of course, the realities are different. We also have to look at, and Percy was pointing at that a bit, science, research. It, it needs to widen. It needs not to be application driven so much, or at least not driven into a direction of application that is meant for, um, at, at the end, sort of giving, paying off a lot of profit. Because we need research into farming and bringing technologies further that basically are, are benefiting the farmers, the environment, the consumer, sort of the whole. And that means it doesn't just looking at how can we improve a seed, improve a seed slightly or change, um, but it also means like how can we do farming practices different, or can we use water resource use different. For example, this whole um, so it's, it's, it's been put in the air, hasn't it? And you've mentioned it earlier, because it's going to feed the world. GM is going to feed the world. And we can have drought resistant, increased yield, all these. And at the end of the day, that's been said for a long time, we haven't got any of that. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, negative results, but also there have been so many other ways developed in the meantime in different uh, agricultural uh, systems that actually completely outcompete, like yield much, much more than even the, the best conventional single monoculture seed because it's a different system. Or you can use water resource management differently. Or you don't grow monoculture, fast growing crops so, uh, that which you use to irrigate because that will put a lot of salinity in the soil because then you need to genetically modify the plant in order to be genetically uh, in order to be salt resistant, right? So, so in a way, there's a lot of research that can be done and a lot of co collaborative and cooperative research. And so, so then, 
a, a question like yours, you know, is there the potential? Can it possibly do? Yes, but it's very, very cost intensive. Um, it is a dream. We, we don't know anything about the reality of it. So therefore, my plea, although I'm a genetic scientist and, and I, I love research and I love laboratory work as well, um, but at the same time, I feel we have to be responsible because there was a lot of talk of the future. What, what do we hand over? And I feel that we need to be able to have um, a system that is able to adapt to different stresses. We have, for example, climate change coming. Oh, coming. Um, well, it's, 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 it's around us, it's surrounding us, or it's here, whatever. Um, but basically what it means is we need the ability of plants and we need the ability of ecosystems, of soils, to buffer um, sort of climatic changes. Which at one time it will be too much water, at another time it will be drought. It will be too hot, it will be too cold, it will be this, it will be that. So that means we need a wide range of biodiversity in that and a flexible system. <coughs> that is you know, usually not maintained in high-bred varieties which are monoculture crops. So therefore, if you're thinking of feeding the world and having responsibility for the future, we also should research into that. That is just, um, yeah, yeah. Ask me again and I'll, 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 I'll answer for another hour. <laughs> I'm going to ask Andrew in a second. Um, is there anyone here from the NFU? Because the NFU, I think, has a, a slightly different perspective on the whole GM debate. Is there anybody here from the NFU? Officially? No. Um, is there anybody here before I, I ask Andrew? Um, <laughs> I don't want anybody to feel, feel scared, but they've got a completely different perspective. Perhaps most of the questions at the moment have been obviously very sympathetic to the position of them, um, particularly of, of Percy. Obviously, it's not difficult to be sympathetic to Percy's position. I just wonder if there is anybody else who feels, sorry, who feels they haven't sort of, you know, their point of view hasn't been expressed. And if there is, put your hand up. And after Andrew, I'll make sure you have your say as well. The gentleman at the back there. Okay. Um, I, I was going to call Andrew next, and I'll call you after that. Okay. Andrew. Andrew Armstrong, Bowering's Animal Feeds and the Wessex Organic Movement. Uh, firstly, I'd like to confirm that it is getting more and more difficult to find non-GM animal feeds and organic uh, soya and maize. Seven years ago, we used to buy organic soya from Canada and the US. Three years ago, we were buying organic soya from Brazil. And probably we only have China and Italy to draw from now. It is getting very difficult. My main point, though, was... We live in a country where there is incredible ignorance in government of agricultural practice. Yes. <laughs> so, so ignorant, in fact, that in the, the consultation document about coexistence, they suggested that the problem would be solved with a 15 metre gap between GM and non GM. <laughs> we, we also live in a society that is becoming increasingly litigious and a society full of lawyers. Perhaps not as much as, as the US. But I, I guess the lawyers could jump one of two ways here. They could either say, whoa, this is just too much of a can of worms, we won't touch it. Or they could rub their hands together in glee and think that all their Christmases have come at once with the possible litigation evolving from this. And I'd be interested to know which way you think the lawyers might jump. <laughs> Back, yeah, John Hawkins, um, Bagra Farms, we grow organic and conventional crops of different types. At the moment, there's about 6 billion people on planet Earth. Um, whether you're an organic or a conventional farmer, we're just about keeping up with feeding most of those um, before you reach war, famine, starvation. It's predicted that the human population, unless war, famine or starvation interferes, is likely to go up to about 9 billion in the next 20 years. So, if anyone's got a good idea, which isn't GM or isn't organic, on how we feed those 3 billion extra human beings, bearing in mind none of us are particularly hungry sat here at the moment, let us know. It'd be interesting. <laughs> Um, 
I would like to actually pick that up because uh, I work a lot, as I said earlier, like with, with uh, communities in the South, meaning like Asia or South America, mostly a colleague is working on with Africa, me, me less so, except in international negotiations. But I am quite aware of what, what is being said, that we are at present producing globally enough food for everyone to be fed. Mm. Yet, we have millions and millions and millions of people just going hungry. So, therefore, the first question in that would be, is where does the food go? Why, why can't people go hungry when we have enough food? So, it's definitely not a production problem. Right? It, it could be a distribution problem. It can also be that the people who don't have anything to eat might also have no money to buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, we had situations where there was um, the need, I think it was Saudi Arabia wanted to have some wheat, I think it was, and uh, they didn't have enough there. And Ethiopia had enough, but it, it was too complicated. Ethiopia is not that far, really. Um, so, so there was, the infrastructure wasn't there to get it there, so it was easier to get it from the U.S., right, all the way than from the country in, in that area. Sometimes it's even within the own country, it's harder to transport it around than to get it in by food aid. It, it's, 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 so it's a distribution problem very often, sometimes it's, it's a financial problem. But let's say... Uh, <coughs> We, we actually also need to look at more production. And there's been a paper out recently by, uh, I think, Badgley et al., 2007, um, which was looking at uh, agricultural systems in the north and in the south in terms of organic or agroecological production or related like that. What they could show is that in the south they could produce 80% more if they, uh, if they use organic or uh, meaning sort of uh, systems that use, for example, uh, green manure <coughs> or that use nitrogen fixing plants, intercropping, or that they could produce a lot more than if they grow conventional. They use a lot of facts and figures in that. And in the north, that uh, if you use organic or conventional, it doesn't necessarily make a big difference in terms of yield. I'm talking about yield. Uh, there's other areas where you can even use different farming techniques completely. Where you, for example, I'm not talking about the north, I'm certainly not talking about the US where you have, where your small fields are the size of whole farms. So, um, therefore, I don't think one could get farmers in the US or in Canada to do intercropping, right? Sort of meaning like growing different crops on the same field because you have your machinery differently designed. So that's a different form of farming. But if you're looking at the south, because that is where, where, where we feel like people would be going hungry, um, because like their countries often are, what is produced is going to the north, either to, uh, you know, now the idea is to produce biofuel for the new north, or it's doing like animal feed, or it's like the coffee, it's cocoa, all that. So a lot is already coming in our direction. So therefore, how could they produce enough food there really for the population? And if you look at some of the scientific uh, research areas, it's if you have one field, one acre, and another field of one acre, in one field you plant wheat, in the other field you plant um, fala beans, right? You can then come, come out with a, a yield. You put it together and you have a yield, right? then you do something different, which is, you use that again, you, you know, but you, you mix them, you intercrop them, and then you look, how much land do you need in order to come to the same result, right? And what they find out is, for example, that once you need two uh, acres in, in conventional monoculture system, you only need 1.4 acres if you plant them together, right? 
that is not necessarily something which is, can be used here, and that is something which is called also uh, Atlantic <coughs> equivalent ratio. You know, there's different ratios, there's different calculations one can do. But, you know, there's a lot of things which can be done. Uh, one can plant uh, also like uh, in, in like in Africa, uh, because it's not just about yield increase, it's also about reducing loss, right? Uh, because of uh, sure. pests, insects. There is an example which is called the push-pull system. Um, they have developed that in uh, Kenya, and uh, together with the uh, UK scientists as well, maize is quite often attacked by the corn borer. Also, crops in Africa, those of you who are uh, obviously sort of, uh, sort of like looking there, sort of like those of you who are working there will know about something called striga, which is sort of a weed, which is really like um, a parasite to the, the plants, and th therefore um, is a problem. So basically you, you can lose the crop because of the corn borer and the striga weed. Now, they have developed a system, scientists, by looking at like, okay, if we just use the ecosystem, like trying to find a supportive system, what could we do? Don't, isn't there maybe a plant around that sort of repels the corn borer? Or maybe there is a plant around that the corn borer really likes and we could use it as an attractant? Or isn't there something that Striga really, but that outcompetes Striga and, and yet it's not interfering with maize? And they really, they, they researched a lot of plants, looked at a lot of grasses, and, and did a lot of research, and finally they came up with, if you have a plot and you plant, there are some grasses, but one of the well-known ones is the napier grass, right? You plant that around your little field, and inside the field you plant this modium, which is a little legume, right? So it also uh, has the benefit of actually uh, fixing nitrogen, right? So you plant that in the middle, uh, between the rows, and what happens is that it outcompetes Striga, so Striga doesn't like the desmodium. Um, also, uh, the corn borer doesn't really like the smell so much of it, there's a repellent in it. But the napier grass around, the corn borer really likes, it goes there, but napier grass has like a sticky substance, so the corn borer is not uh, basically enhanced by it, but gets sort of stuck there. And <laughs> therefore, you have a system that works, but on top of that, they can sell the napier grass in the market as animal feed, right? So you, you have an enrichment system, you know, like the, the, the smodium inside. And it really has increased yield, or like what they harvest, extremely. But now that is spreading really amongst farms, and they, they sit down together and share it. And so, you know, we can develop different systems. Definitely we do not need a BT crop all of a sudden, because that would be the one which would be suggested, you know. Um, by BT, I mean uh, it's a crop which would have been given a toxin from Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a soil organism, that would kill a certain larvae from like uh, butterflies or from, for example, the corn borer. And you, know, and, and you have a lot of other positives added to it at the same time. You know, so that is research which is extremely underfunded, but we might actually want to, to look at it again, rather than trying to uh, design the perfect plant that has everything in it, and then one thing goes wrong and then everything is lost. Just a brief comment about uh land now being used uh, to make biodiesel in North America, land that was formerly used to make it to, uh, to use for food production. And uh, because what has happened, we have been sitting on a mountain of corn, soya, and in Canada a lot on rapeseed. So now they said because we, the economic issue has been devastating because we have not uh, been able to sell our products in many countries of the world, we're making biodiesel. So now we're taking uh, food or uh, crops that were raised for food now making biodiesel. The whole issue of whether you feed a hungry world, we say there's three issues here. It takes political will, it takes economic issues, and it takes transportation and the will to do it. That's what feeds a hungry world. Economic issue has been really, uh, like I said, devastating. 
Another, another industry that's been destroyed in Western Canada, we no longer can sell our honey to many countries of the world because our honey now is contaminated with GMOs. So that's another industry. A bee doesn't know which flower is GMO and which is not. But most of all, we are reducing the supply of world food, food for people, by going via diesel. That's a whole new issue in North America because they say if you use one unit of energy, to produce one unit of energy, you're no farther ahead, but you're taking food away from people. I'm just going to take two more questions and then ask all of the panel to have their final say and pick up. So there's a gentleman there, and there was a hand of a lady on the far side of the bug mirror. Okay, so the gentleman there first, then the lady there. Yes, I'd, I'd like to come back and ask the question about intellectual property and patents, which Could I believe have is your the name, more please? tonight. Who are you? I'm, yep, I'm John Edgeley. I own an organic farm, but I'm really an engineer. I'm really an aeronautical engineer, and so I do know a little bit about patents, because I have one or two aircraft patents uh, in my own name, so I know about patents in terms of engineering. Uh, I, I, I've heard what I have about... Um, intellectual property and patenting genes, life genes, and frankly, I am totally, totally horrified. I'm absolutely horrified that the patenting system can be used in that way, and I think it's absolutely wrong. Yeah. Now, I, my, my actual question is to ask if, the, if, 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 if any of the speakers are able to tell us what the position in Europe is. Because we've heard about the position in, in Canada. Um, I don't know if people realize, but the, the, the whole question of patents, there's no international law on patents. Patents are governed by individual countries, and individual countries have their own, their own way of going about this. Uh, in the UK, uh, our patent law was always quite different to the US law, which is perhaps the bit I know most about. We don't have UK patent law anymore because now we, we, we have a European patent law. But I would like to know where we are in Europe on this and what the European Patent Office have done about this and what their views are about the US patents. And I assume, but I don't know, I assume the Canadian patents are roughly in line with the US patents. I would be very interested to know where we are on this. The problem, of course, is but patents don't get tested. Patent law doesn't get tested until it goes to court. And that is the real problem, that until something happens, nothing goes to court, and the patent law is not tested. Then, of course, when it does go to court, the problem is that big corporations have lots of money, and the little people don't have very much money, and it all all incredibly unfair just as it's incredibly unfair that little people have patents that they're trying to defend against the big corporations. We're not here to discuss that tonight. But there's a big problem here. I've added a small organic uh, site in South Gloucestershire. And at the moment, the, apparently, um, the EU, or you know, various governments of the EU are meeting to try and find ways to get round the, op the public opposition to GM foods. And I'm just wondering why governments are so pro GM and what, if you know how Monsanto and the biotech uh, companies pressurize governments to be so, so against really their own people, the opi opinions of their own people, regarding um, the GM issue? <coughs> That's a big question. Okay, I'm going to ask all three of you to see. Um, Ricardo's going to answer the question from the gentleman here, and then they're all going to have a final, final say, and try and answer your very big question from over there. Should I just of ethics? So not all the patents which are being applied for uh, are being granted, which are otherwise granted in the U.S. Uh, especially also in the past, it would have been on any kind of 
gene sequences where one does not even know what, what they might do or might not do, what ones fish them out. And in the US, it was possible just to get a patent on them. But that is also being revoked in, in, in the US to some extent. Um, and in, in a way, you are right. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of discussion and debate uh, in, before the patent directive was passed in 98, where also quite a lot of scientists and uh, even sort of scientists from, from the Seymour Institute here in, in, in UK, in, in Cambridge, who are into sequencing, they were standing up and saying, asking the MPs, MPs, MEPs, members of the European Parliament, not to go ahead with, with this uh, directive. But it's very difficult, you know, sort of like I went there to talk with some of the MEPs. But I mean, I, a lot of them whom I talked with, I haven't been aware, of, they didn't even understand what a gene was. Mm -hmm. Leave alone what a gene construct is, you know, and the difference, because that's crucial in this, right? And because there was a, a big, big push by the pharmaceutical industry, mostly, you know, to, to get these patent directive in place, and that is what we have at present. And so therefore you are right, it gets only uh, really tested in, in court, and we just won the case after, what, 13 years, which was, uh, in, I mean, I was a, a, a scientific expert in that, in, in, in the battles in Munich against the, the, the broad Monsanto patents and, and soya beans, which, which we um, finally succeeded to, to win because it really was outrageous. But it's really like, it needs to be that outrageous in order to, to be revoked. And um, so it, this issue should really be re-debated and re-discussed. And uh, yeah, but this, this, there is quite a number of countries which are not very happy with it. And so we have to see whether there's a, a turmoil sort of enough, sort of a rumbling enough uh, going. But I think it would help if once in a while we would remind our MPs and MEPs that uh, that's still an outstanding issue. I should maybe comment on the Canadian patent law, which was passed in 1869, two years after the American one in 1867. We have a federal law in Canada that states you cannot patent a seed or plant in Canada. So when our, now this is what happened, Harvard University, two years before my case came to court, came to Canada to the patent office to get a patent on the Alco mouse case. And where they said they had put a gene into a mouse which would make it more suitable for cancer research. So they came to the patent office that they invented the mouse by having that gene in it. The patent office did not allow it. And it went all the way. Harvard University took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, in a 5 4 decision, ruled no, you did not invent the mouse. We will not give you a patent. So we thought, when my case came to court, that we had really a good case because they did not allow the patenting of a higher life form. So what they did then is that the Supreme Court ruled in a 5-4 split decision, that if you have a patent on the gene, and you put the gene into any higher life form, as I said before, you own and control that higher life form. Yet you cannot get a patent on a seed or a plant, but by having a patent on a gene, you insert in that life form, you own and control that life form. Harvard University has since come back, almost immediately after our case, to the, screen, uh, to the patent office, were granted the patent on the gene that they put in the mouse, they now own and control the mouse. <laughs> so that's, so, so what the Supreme Court said, or what the legal profession said, and what my lawyer said, you are now permitting something indirectly that you would not uh, permit directly. Um, and the lawyers also said to the Supreme Court, all right, you cannot put a patent that you own Canada. But if you put a patent on each province and each territory of Canada, you do own Canada. <laughs> um, I can speak for half an hour on some of the questions. Um, going back to the question on um, how do we feed the world, 
Um, I didn't actually dress up like this for you tonight. I've been with um, our leading supermarket for five hours today, discussing the, the plight of farmers with them. Um, and I guess one of the ways we could help feed the world is if farmers got a fair share of the retail price. But again, from my travels, I think the world would have no problem feeding itself mm. easily, even with more people. Mm. As was already mentioned, there's a lot of waste. When I was in India, the um, <coughs> fruit going to total waste because nobody would provide any funds to build a factory to put it into cans or to juice it or to do something else. And on that, one of the things that I <laughs> found was I, I was with a group of um, other people uh, taking part in a, a, what was called a citizen's jury. I won't go into that, but it was, that was why I was there. And um, we had a, a visit around the neighbourhood. And I went to several villages, and in one village they had a tremendous range of crops, very green, very lush, and I said, why is this village that much different from the last one, which was very brown and dry, and they said, ah, we've got wire cages, and I said, you've got what? Wire cages? Oh, what do you do with those? We build dams with what they've got, you know the thing that they use alongside public roads that they fill up with stones the whole way around. Action Aid or Christian Aid, I can't remember which one it was, had provided them with four and a half thousand of these cages. And they were in a monsoon rain-fed agricultural system. All they had done, with the aid of somebody that had also been, is conducted, uh, constructed dams over some of the gullies where the water, when it came down, usually just ran straight down and into the river. <coughs> And um, that water, because it had been slowed down, soaked into the ground. Their water level in their wells was 20 foot higher than the wells just down the road. And <laughs> I said to the guy next to me, well, it's a lot better than that stupid idea that they had in the last village, which was to provide them with a the computer so they had access to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whose stupid idea it was, but, but for a start, you've given them a keyboard with English on it, and the local language was Italian, so they had no idea which key did what. Then I discovered, he said, well, actually, we did. And I went, oh, well, who did? And he said, I'm the Dutch ambassador to India, and the Dutch government have provided the money for these computers. And he said, I'm going to go back and look at the idea of supplying them with wire cages. <laughs> and I think there's a moral in that, in that sometimes when we think we're helping, we're not. Um, and I, I, just to, to another slap on that, I was very privileged to bring over some American farmers back along to talk about American farming at GM in America. And we also had some Indian farmers who were on transit through actually to Peru. Um, and we had a meeting between them. And one of these guys from America, Corky Jones, who lives in Nebraska, said, I've got 2,800 acres, and I can't feed my family. And one of the Indian farmers, through the translator, said, how big is your family? <laughs> I, have, I, I, have, I have nine acres, and I feed 16 people. <laughs> Um, and she came from the village that had the white cages. So I guess the, what I'm getting at is there are ways to feed the world that don't require a technological fix. And to go back to the question that was, was um, asked a minute ago about um, GM, why is it being pushed? Because, again, having seen today our leading supermarket, um, it's all about cheap food. And governments see GM as a technological fix to continue to provide cheap food. And we have to get away from the idea that food is a commodity, that there's a technological fix for it. Food is important 
for all of us. Without food, we don't survive. So we have to be very careful when we, I'm going to use the word mess with it, but I don't mean that just in the GM way, but in any other way. And we need to, I guess, you know, MEPs, MPs, we need to be talking to them about how important food is. And I agree with you, you know, people don't know that. I mean, the people I was talking to today have no idea what happens on the dairy farm or the arable farm or whatever. We need to get away from that. Um, I think, oh, just one thing on what you said. There are GM medicines. And people often say, well, you know, if you're against GM and you don't like that idea, what about GM medicines? My answer to that is that, that GM medicines are developed in laboratories <coughs> where it is strictly controlled and it can't affect anything else. And therefore, you cannot say that that is bad technology or wrong technology. <coughs> what is wrong is what Percy mentioned earlier, which is these pharmaceutical crops where we're starting to put things. I mean, something that I think a lot of people up about whether we can control these companies. My understanding was that in the States, that any pharmaceutical crops that were grown would be grown in non native crops so that there wasn't the risk of. Um, gene transfer to the, the, the locally grown crops. So what they do, they put it into soybeans and they put it into maize. Yeah. And, and rice. And rice, which are the, the, rice, yeah. the, the, the big main local crops. So if they don't even obey what they've said they will do in order to prevent cross-contamination in the first place, then we're not going to control them. Um, so, you know, we're going to need, if we, if we um, don't persuade politicians that they need to take some action soon on the patents and on the fact that this is not a technological fix, we are going to be in trouble. And one of the things that my organisation has been pushing for is before we contaminate the entire world with GM, that there are a number of places that are still GM free um, and luckily some of those are islands, including ourselves and Ireland. And that maybe we should look at what we are calling international reserves, where the seed is GMO free, mm -hmm. to be there as a fallback position when it goes wrong, <coughs> if it goes wrong, mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. Thank you. Really, uh, one is that as a geneticist, I personally, but that is my way of looking at it. I find it fascinating what one can learn by looking also at what's going on inside a plant, by looking at the proteins, by looking at the genes. Even the tool of genetic engineering is very helpful in understanding processes. So therefore, for me. It is a real helpful research tool. Um, but that does not mean it is wise to just use this research tool in order to modify a plant or something else and then put it into the environment. Right? But for, for me, I, I can see differences there between it being a research tool, and one can use it in the laboratory in under contained conditions and the environment um, or food supply. That is one of the points I wanted to, to, to say. Um, but that's my personal opinion. That, that one is something actually very positive about, uh, about it, the learning. The other part is um, our idea about, it could be a, probably filling a whole other evening, I guess, the idea and definition of progress. <laughs> right, right now we seem to be defining progress as a technological advancements in one direction that is sort of this, um, almost like, there's this expression, I think, of putting all one's eggs into one basket. Um, then 
just fingers crossed, no stormy times are ahead. <laughs> and for me, that is not progress. If, if you just like go into one direction without actually like ignoring everything else, for me that is actually more related to um, blinkered tunnel vision, not progress. Progress for me would mean look around. What do we have as knowledge? What do we have as possibilities? Where do we advance further? Let us broaden and but move forward. We can develop technologies more, but that does not mean um, it's down to a techno fix. Because a techno fix for me is is not a progress. Because it's trying to fix a problem that technology usually has created in the first place. Like in the terms of agriculture, a lot of the monoculture systems have been uh, problematic in terms of high pesticide use because uh, all of a sudden like, big monocultures will be an invitation for, for uh, insects to come and feed it as food, you know. Uh, it will sort of do something to soil that the soil will not be able to uh, replenish itself in the same way, so it needs fertilizers. Then we all of a sudden say, we have a problem with the different kind of weeds now because monocultures mean only that particular plant is allowed to grow there and nothing else. Every other plant is a competitor, so get rid of the weeds. So we slowly come at we have too many pests, we have too many weeds we have in that system, so therefore it comes like a genetic fix. But all of that was, the first, the first help was the pesticides, the first fix, then the next fix is the um, the, the GM, and when we have problems through that, what is then, right? So we will be continuously stacking technical <coughs> fixes. That for me does not spell progress. And so therefore I, I feel like it is important that we actually reclaim what progress means and challenge our politicians because they keep talking about progress, you know, standing in the way of progress. <coughs> Was I feel we are the ones actually like when we put our minds to it who help sort of develop and bring about sort of a future that has sustainable agriculture and that's safe and good to live in. Um, so, well, that's what I would rather do. Okay. concentrate a lot of what has happened and does happen with the introduction of GMOs and to bring you awareness about that. As I mentioned before, we now have 13 full crop years where we've grown GMOs in Canada. So it's no longer, as I said before, what can happen or may happen, but what does happen with the introduction of GMOs. Again, the three important things, choice is gone, you cannot contain it, and there's no such thing as coexistence. So those are three important things. What can you do about it? I was a former member of the provincial parliament. If I look at my days in, in government, if I got one or two letters on a certain subject, it was one or two letters from my constituents, but if I started getting 50, 100, 200 letters on a subject, believe me, it was brought up in caucus and it was addressed. A lot of politicians will look at it this way and say, it can't really be an issue. I've only got a couple letters from a constituent, so it can't be very important. So just take the time and in just a sentence or two in your own writing, not a form letter, and send, send it to your MP or your provincial or I don't know, or MLA here locally, and let them know what the feelings are. Ninety-one percent of the Canadian people in the survey three years ago said they would not eat GMOs if they knew what was in their food. And that's why there's such a strong opposition by the, by the companies on pressure on the government not to do, introduce GMOs. But another important thing I should mention what has happened in the regulatory body of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Monsanto, we found out that there has been no testing done on any new GMOs when it was introduced in Canada. 
by the Canadian Food Instruction Agency. And the companies would always say, it's safe because the regulatory body of the Department of Agriculture gave permission. Three years ago, I took all the information that was supplied by Monsanto to the Canadian government about GMOs. I took it to the School of Science in Japan, and they redid all the experimentation of all the, on the, all the documentation submitted to the Canadian government by Monsanto. In their final report to the Health Ministry of Japan, of Japan, they said all the documentation submitted to the Canadian government by Monsanto was fraudulent and falsified. <laughs> that is a submission by the School of Science to the Health Ministry of Japan. So when they say it has been government approved, approved by who? Yes. So again, as I said earlier, I have not come here to England to tell you what to do. I've come here as an aware to bring you our awareness of what has happened with the introduction of GMOs. I also earlier said I, I believe we're at a fork in the road, and that fork has become very important. Which way we go? Down the GMO way or the non-GMO way? Because remember, once it's introduced, at this time we do not know if it ever can be recalled back. So Dean, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm told to make a Dorset flower. I know that quite often Stephen does make bread with flour from Edward's farm at the Serpent, which is why I just asked him if it was his. Anyway, we're told, my, my we're told that this is made in Dorset flour. And we have a sheet of wheat in bread to give to Percy <laughs> all the way from the Thank you. 